Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to hand off uh, this web meeting to Trey Hearn. Trey Hearn is uh, going to be our presenter. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, today's presentation is about uh, the criminal justice system and its impact on the Black community. And we'll also talk about uh, some solutions. Dave, if we can go to the first slide. Can you all see that? Can, so, you, can you see the presentation? Yes. I can. You should make it full screen. I think there should be an option. I believe there is a full screen version somewhere, but I don't know why I can't do it. Oh, this is this is good. Okay, Can everyone see it looks it? good to me. Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, so this summer, uh, over the last, I would say for the last five, seven years here in Minnesota, the police accountability movement in the city of St. Paul, in across Minnesota, has really uh, heated up. Uh, we can go to the next slide too. So here in St. Paul, for about 20 years or so, or more, there were never really protests in St. Paul because of some political reasons uh, that had happened. So a lot of things would happen behind closed doors. In 2015, uh, Marcus Golden was murdered by the St. Paul Police Department, and that started the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, not the first Black Lives Matter protest here in Minnesota, but one of the first protests here, Martin was killed by George Zimmerman uh, when he was on his way from, from the store from grabbing some Skittles, and that is what prompted the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. George Zimmerman was not even a police officer, but he was still acquitted uh, for, um, or, or was not sent to prison for murder and Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin was unarmed um, and was just walking home from the from the store. He had a hoodie on, and he was a youth. A lot of people. Um, so a lot of this presentation will also center on what's happening with the youth and how they're impacted by the criminal justice system um, at an early age and how it traumatizes them. Also, so uh, Trayvon was uh, still a young child. Uh, had a had his whole life ahead of him, and it was taken away from him from him for nothing, and no one was ever punished for it. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So Mike Mike Brown was also leaving a store, had some interactions with uh, the store owner uh, when he was leaving. Uh, he was approached by the police and then uh, witnesses say that he had his hands up and then when he has when he had his hands up is when uh, the officer shot and killed Mike Brown and then this was another uh, situation that led to uh, mass protests and some civil disobedience down in uh, Ferguson, Missouri that and that's I think where the chant uh, "Don't hands up, don't shoot" come from. So my uh, after this after this situation, there was a, a lot of protest down in Ferguson, Missouri, but also the city council changed, and there was uh, some changeover in government, but still not not far enough. Also, Ferguson, Missouri was one of the um, poorest cities in the country, so there were 
just besides the police brutality issue, there were a lot of systemic issues that the black people in Ferguson, uh, Missouri face, and they're similar uh, across the country. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, and Mike Brown was only about 20 years old himself. Tamir Rice was 12 years old and he was in a public park and he was had a toy gun. And then the um, police officer, Cleveland police officer pulled up on him while he had a toy gun. He's a 12 year old child, uh, kind, kind of large frame. And then the police pulled up on him. It was instant, instant. There was no time, really no negotiation. The police got out the car and killed him. Um, and that police officer was never convicted of killing this child. And uh, Samira Rice, she did get uh, a settlement, but there really wasn't a lot of change as far as um, legislation wise for the police in Cleveland or anywhere across the country after this has happened and no, um, just no charges. And this is again, a 12 year old boy who was shot and killed by, by police. And just when that happens, that traumatizes the black community in that city. But then once we see it on TV across the country, we're traumatized. If children see something like this on TV, it, it causes uh, for them to be traumatized too. And even while I'm speaking, um, we're organizing a pro there's protests being organized right now for over in Minneapolis last night. Uh, some people were out protesting and then I think some militia or armed people who were hired to maybe protect some buildings came out and started grabbing people up and they wouldn't identify themselves and they weren't, they were not police. But Tamir Rice was a 12 year old child who was killed by the Cleveland police and there was never uh, any justice, real justice uh, in his murder. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So Marcus Golden, in 2015, Marcus Golden was uh, murdered by the St. Paul Police Department. He was outside of an apartment building and um, the police were, uh, came there. They say that he had a gun, but he did, when I, I, I remember this vividly too. They said that he had a gun, but the first story came out the first time the news reported on it, there was no report of a gun, but then by 2, 2 p.m., there was a, there was, uh, they said there was a gun found at the scene. So this is when we started talking about, uh, yeah, oh, yes, Ben, right, right at the end of the presentation, uh, we can, we can ask those questions. But, as you're saying that, that question with this situation, there was a, a grand jury involved in, in this situation also. Um, so Marcus Golden, he was uh, murdered by the St. Paul Police Department outside of a, they said that he had a gun, but uh, we know that he didn't have a gun. Well, we well what we were told by witnesses is that the police officers slipped on some ice and started firing their weapons. So they were going to say that he tried to run them over, but that's uh, not really what we believe has happened. So his aunt is named Monique Colors Dottie, and she is the founder of the Black Lives Matter Minnesota chapter uh, that we work with here in Minnesota. Marcus Golden's mother was also a volunteer police officer. So she would volunteer at the state fair every year for about 20 years. And um, so I know some of you might've heard about a chant like pigs in a blanket or something. So we did a, because his mother was volunteering at the state fair uh, for so many years and was killed by the people that she was volunteering for, we decided to start having annual marches at the state fair. Uh, and the first one that, that we did was 
was pretty massive and it was trending uh, on Twitter and things like that. Before the murder of Marcus Golden in the city of St. Paul, like I was saying earlier, there were never protests like this here because of some agreements certain black organizations had with the St. Paul Police Department. Um, after uh, Marcus was killed, that, that agreement was broken and we started doing mass protest here in St. Paul and throughout the state of the state of Minnesota. Um, and Monique Culler's daughter, Marcus's aunt, uh, she protests for everybody, every family uh, that's a victim here of police brutality. She's always there uh, to comfort them um, and, and to put in work to help their, their family get justice and, and the resources that they need to do that. And uh, hopefully, and she just, but because she does that, you know, it's been hard for her to work on Marcus's case. So right now she's kind of starting to refocus and, and, and start, start working more on, on Marcus's issue. If we can go to the next slide. Could you please mute your microphone if you are attendee? So Marcus Abram, he was, uh, is an autistic youth. Again, uh, he was a youth when this happened to him. He was at uh, the Metro Transit light rail station and he was waiting on, on the train and he kind of was having a, a mental health crisis himself. And the police approached him and um, ended up knocking him out to where he fell out, fell on the train tracks from the platform. And uh, he ended up, he said, when we spoke with him, he said all he remembers is waking up in the hospital and, um, you know, suffering and stuff like that. Uh, subsequently, so we, we uh, or that was after Marcus Golden. So then we, this happened here in St. Paul. So then we organized a, a rally called uh, Black Rail and shut down the light rail station. Um, and then after that, that officer was fired. And then Marcus Gold, Marcus, Mark Abrams was awarded, I think about $250,000. Um, so that we, you know, we don't, it's good to get uh, cops or officers off the force who are causing harm in our community. So we were kind of happy or excited that we were able to do that. But we know that we have to continue to keep pushing. Some of the statistics with Metro Transit, uh, black people would always get harassed for, um, like they will come on and check people's fares. And a lot of times um, they will walk right past white people and go straight to black people. Or even more, the Native Americans would be uh, taken off the train at the highest rate more than anybody in the state of Minnesota. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So um, this summer, well, in, in for 2020, we heard that uh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. We would hear chants of I can't breathe because of what happened to George Floyd. But a few years earlier, uh, the first time where we heard I can't breathe at this intensity, I'm not saying Eric Garner is the first person to say that I can't breathe because I've been pepper sprayed be before myself and I couldn't breathe either. And, um, or with tear gas and things like that. But this happened on national TV. We, this was also uh, seen on national TV where uh, Eric Garner had the life um, choked out of him by a New York police officer. And in many of these cases too, these, this is not these uh, officers first time uh, murdering or killing somebody. This officer uh, had, had, has done this before to people and there were many complaints similar to Derek Chauvin. And Derek Chauvin had uh, choked children before, like a 14 year old ch child before he had even um, murdered George Floyd, but the officer who killed 
or murdered Eric, Eric Gardner, he was never arrested. He was never convicted um, for the death of, of Eric Gardner, even though everybody watched him uh, get choked to death on national TV. And again, these things, when, when black people see this and then there's no justice, it causes uh, trauma and, and, in, and, and in a sense fear because we don't wanna be the next person that this that this happened. Uh, so there were mass protests in New York and across the country when this first happened. And, um, but there was still not uh, the level of police accountability that we, that we want to see and that uh, black people deserve. And if we can go to the next slide. And I actually, um, so there's a woman named Kimberly Handy Jones. She just last weekend, she was up here and she gives headstones to um, families who have lost a loved one to police violence. So we met Eric Garner's mother. She was here and she has received a, a headstone. Last weekend, um, Charlena Lyles' family was here. She was uh, killed. She was a pregnant woman who was killed by the pol by, uh, police in Seattle. Alton Sterling's family was here last week. Uh, they were, his family was, he was killed by the police in Louisiana. Phil Quinn is, an, uh, was, is a Native American who was having a mental health crisis and his family called the police for help. When uh, the police came, they say that Phil had a knife and that they, uh, and so that's why they killed him or shot him several times until he died. They said that he rushed at them, but uh, there were no tasers used. There were no like rubber bullets used. Uh, there were other means that we think could have been used before they went right away to uh, killing him. And the murder of Phil Quinn is still impacting his uh, fiance at the time and their children. When we did, um, we had a rally for Phil, it was called Black Marathon. And we, uh, every year they would have a big marathon here. And we, um, Walter Wallace, yes. When he, we uh, shut down uh, the, the uh, marathon, we called it Black Marathon and we shut down the marathon. But what stuck out to me was that his children were very young and they understood everything that was happening at that time. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Or we can go to the next one too. So when we talk about police brutality, we're not just talking about what's happening in um, with the police, or we talk about criminal justice and black bodies. We're not just talking about police brutality. It also happens inside jails and prisons. And uh, Sandra Bland was an activist. She was very outspoken and she was pulled over by the police. And um, when she was in custody, she, uh, she was found, she died. And a lot of people feel that she was killed because she was a very outspoken uh, person. So police brutality isn't just affecting black men, it's also starting to affect uh, black women like Sandra Bland, uh, Corinne Gaines, and Charlena Lyles, like I just mentioned, and also uh, Breonna Taylor. We can go to the next slide. So the Green Party uh, Black Caucus and our National Green Party and our media committee was involved early on in helping get the word out about the death of Hardell Sherrill. Hardell Sherrill is my sister's son, my sister Delshia um, contacted me like the uh, the prison, uh, the sheriffs came to her and, and, and told her that her son was uh, found dead in Beltrami County Jail. And the story that they told us was like, he died in their arms and they tried to save him and resuscitate him. So after that, we started fighting uh, to get answers. Uh, we went to, up to Beltrami County to the jail. And in this, in this particular jail, uh, Bemidji, Minnesota has a high native population. It's all of Minnesota is native land. And um, 
but up in Bemidji, it's still kind of like there's reservations and stuff uh, surrounding there. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And she, um, so we went up there and started demanding protest and started protesting. And then when we went up there, we started hearing from other families like uh, the May family, who's um, Tony May died in this in the same jail. Uh, Stephanie Bunker died in the j same jail. So people started reaching out to my sister and start telling them telling them her story. And uh, we found out that Beltrami County Jail has uh, a lot of a lot of inmates there have died. So we kept pressing and pressing and doing actions and organizing, and it just opened up uh, so much, so many problems with Beltrami County Jail, which after a, a review has said that the jail is about, it's only been around for about 30 or 40 years, but because the lack of, because the facility isn't being taken care of, that is actually about 200 years old. Uh, that's how bad a shape it is. It has urinals in the girls' part of the prison. There's a woman named Stephanie Bunker who was found hanging. She's a Native American, and she was found uh, dead and dead in there, uh, hanging hanging in there. So there was a, a, a lot of issues around Beltrami County Jail and some of their practices and procedures. If we could play the clip, and then I can explain a little more. Can you guys hear it? No. Is there something where the volume needs to turn up or? Well, so basically is um, what's happening here is this is Katie Wright uh, with the sunglasses on and then Delshia Perry is in the middle. That's Hardell's um, mother. And then this is a nurse who has the microphone. And she, she was the whistleblowing nurse who told what she seen happen with Dr. Leonard, who we call uh, AKA Dr. Death. Dr. Leonard is the uh, owner of Men Correctional Facility and Men Correctional Facility offers healthcare to inmates in jails inside in Minnesota uh, jails. Uh, he's also inside uh, Iowa and I think uh, North Dakota. Um, so right now, just last week, like, uh, well, there is a hearing about whether he's going to be able to uh, continue to practice medicine earlier this week. Um, but he he's a uh, men correctional. So once Delshia started doing these rallies and this actions, this woman came forward. Uh, there was, uh, after the initial, first they said he died in their arms and they tried to resuscitate him. When we kept pushing, the body camera footage was released and we found out that they left him lying on the floor for up to eight hours to die. Uh, and so what she was, what she's explaining right now is what she's seen when she came into the jail and that she's seen uh, he was in his urine, he was in his diapers, he laid on the floor for eight hours, he couldn't reach the thing, and they basically just watched, watched him die. Um, they tried to say he died of pneumonia, but he died of, uh, is, it's hard for me to pronounce it, Brunei sy syndrome, so where your face starts to droop and you start to become paralyzed, but he, if he would have been rushed to the hospital like uh, the doctors told him, like he was supposed to be, he would, he would still be alive today. Uh, but that that the work of Delshia Perry on the Hardell Sherrill, Sherrill case has led to 55 new investigations into deaths in Minnesota jails that have happened since 2015. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So George Floyd uh, was murdered by Derek Chauvin. Derek Chauvin had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for close to 10 minutes. 
uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, the police were called on George Floyd because George Floyd supposedly had uh, some uh, counterfeit. But however, it, whatever he was caught, the police were called on him for, it was not worth his life. When the police came, uh, they pulled him out the car. He started saying that he was uh, claustrophobic. Once they had had him on the ground, uh, Officer Derek Chauvin kept his knee on George Floyd's neck for up to nine minutes and 26 seconds in front of the whole community. Uh, luckily, there was a young woman there named Darnella Frazier over a $20 bill, exactly. And the, and the thing about that's so disappointing about this is that George Floyd comes from a family that uh, had 500 acres. His grandpa had basically brought itself out of slavery, then uh, acquired 500 acres of land, and then that land was stolen from him. So if we, if George, we think if that didn't happen, George Floyd wouldn't have even been in Minnesota and wouldn't have died over $20. Uh, a, a lot of land was stolen from Black people or Black people lost a lot of land throughout the years uh, through different means and that impacts our generational wealth. And uh, if we can go to the next slide. So this is um, some new body, well, it was not new, but it was body cam footage that was released. I didn't want to show the actual knee being on his neck because I know we've seen, we've all seen that and this has been uh, very traumatizing, but um, if we can play this clip and then we'll talk about it some more. I don't know what's wrong with the volume, but in this clip, uh, he's actually already saying he can't breathe. He's claustrophobic. He's claustrophobic. Uh, he's letting the officer know that he's not a bad person and that he's just he's having problems breathing. And so the police are forcing him inside. Are starting to force him inside the car. And then this is what, uh, after this, they pull him outside the car. And then that's when Derek Chauvin arrives and puts his knee on his, on George Floyd's neck for close to 10 minutes. Uh, so this incident was uh, right in, in, in broad daylight. There were community members there. There were children there. Uh, there were several children there. And some of those children live streamed what happened. And uh, the whole nation got to see what happened. And then this led to civil unrest here in Minnesota and throughout the country and some of the uh, biggest protests in American history. Uh, we, can, we can go to the, to the next slide. So, yeah, so, um, after after the murder of George Floyd here in um, in Minnesota, uh, it the community came together and started having mass protests. The flat, the site of George Floyd became a memorial where people from all over the country would come to visit to see the uh, outpouring of love and support. There was um, there would be food out there. There would be uh, music out there. It would just be a it was a community that. Uh, was starting to grow and that and that that energy was spreading all throughout the Twin Cities even over into St. Paul and other places where people were just really looking out for each other uh, when you we, if you will go to George Floyd Square there would be food there would be uh, if you needed there would be diapers there would be milk there would be uh, everything that people not just to sit there and eat but you could all for those who needed it for those who needed it they would be able to take all those things home too. So that's uh, that was some of the good. It, that was some of the good things that came out of the George Floyd rebellion. All the new connections and new organizations that were born out of it, and the awareness of the police brutality that's happening in the United States and how it impacts uh, Black community members. 
and how we were saying earlier is uh, in more, we're starting to see more incidents where women are becoming the uh, victims of police brutality, like Corinne Gaines, who was killed by the Baltimore Police Department. Charlena Lyles was killed in Seattle. Uh, we talked about Sandra Bland, and then Breonna Taylor was murdered in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, over a, due to a no-knock a no warrant when a police officer came, came to her house and didn't announce who they were. Her uh, boyfriend at the time uh, fired back and then the police fired and ended up killing Breonna Taylor. Uh, subsequently, a house was, a house behind her house was hit, but the officers were not um, prosecuted for the murder or for killing Breonna Taylor, but they were uh, charged for sh the bullet going into the house, for wreck, for being reckless and a bullet going into a house nearby. So that's why uh, a lot of times over the summer, you will see, hear us talking of saying things like people over property, uh, like our lives, our lives matter more than buildings. And uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, again, uh, Dante Wright, only about 20 years old, and he was um, driving with a friend on, on his way home. I think he was with his uh, girlfriend, and he was uh, driving. The police pulled him over, supposedly said he had a warrant. I don't know if that is true or not. Uh, when Officer Kim Potter approached him, there was some uh, type of small struggle and then uh, she reached in her pocket and started saying, taser, 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 taser. And then she ended up shooting the 20-year-old. Uh, and then he died uh, as a result of that. Uh, she said she thought her, her gun was her taser, but she's been on the force for at least, she's been on the force longer than Dante Wright has been alive. And um, it was just a really, really horrible situation, but this also too caused a lot of outrage and um, some civil unrest in Brooklyn Center. And Brooklyn Center is like a suburb of Minneapolis. So for this, and she, I would say uh, Kobe Heisler was also killed in Brooklyn by the Brooklyn Center Police Department. He was having a mental health crisis. Uh, I think he was also autistic and he was murdered by the Brooklyn Center Police Department too in his driveway. Uh, but Dante Wright was unarmed and he was uh, pulled over and, and murdered. Uh, we, we can go to the next clip. And, but again, I also want to, before we, before we play this, I, just with George Floyd, I just want to, um, no, we can go ahead. We can go ahead. So in this clip, it's going to actually show um, what happened to Dante Wright uh, during during that traffic stop. And uh, this is what we talk about. We talk about driving while black. And this is uh, Dante Wright's car. And if we could hear the video in a minute, you'll be able to hear her saying taser, taser, taser uh, before she ends up killing him. So that's actually a gun. And she's saying she thought it was her taser. And she's a 26 year uh, veteran on the police force. And she's saying she couldn't tell her taser from her gun. And uh, so he, uh, so this is the chief of police who uh, we directly, uh, Green Party of Minnesota leadership and BLM Minnesota called for that, that officer's resignation. And then he did, was forced to resign. Uh, the city manager was also forced to resign. Even in, um, and Kim Potter was arrested, even with, um, 
George Floyd when Derek Chauvin and the other officers were arrested. That had never happened in, in Minnesota before like that, where uh, in that where that in that quick of time where officers were arrested. And we don't think they would, would have been arrested if there was not civil unrest and mass protests in, in the streets and people uh, demanding something be done about it. Uh, that's Dante Wright's mother, who you've seen it in the um, last clip, Katie, and she's been out demanding justice for Dante too. Uh, uh, that people, his family and community members want to see, uh, she was, the, Kim Potter was arrested for like an accidental shooting of Dante Wright, but people wanted to be uh, for murder, like murder one or murder two. We, and again, Dante Wright's only 20 years old, basically still a child. And we're seeing how uh, the theme of black children of uh, being either traumatized by police or, or killed. And um, so after George Floyd happened and Dante Wright happened after uh, George Floyd. And again, those protests and the civil unrest is what, what led to uh, Oh, is the host muted? Maybe that's it. Diana said the sound could be uh, not working because the host is muted. Okay, I got a lawnmower going in the background. I will try and keep the volume up. Um, I was trying to turn it down at certain points when you were talking to try and be accommodable to your message. Here, you want me to me for me to play this one? Yes, sir. Thank you, too. Columbus's police department and mayor say they've never released police body camera video so quickly, uh, but they wanted to be transparent here. Even still, there's growing outrage here and across the nation. A warning here that the video you're about to see is disturbing. Overnight, anger and anguish after another police shooting. This time, 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant in Columbus, Ohio. Shut down! On Wednesday, the city released more body cam video capturing Brian's final moments. Regardless of the circumstances, a 16-year-old girl lost her life yesterday. Police say the teen was threatening two other girls with a knife. Officer Nicholas Reardon, with the force since December 2019, was responding to a 911 call about an altercation. We got these brothers over here trying to fight us, trying to stop us, trying to put our hands on our grandma. Get here now. When Officer Reardon arrives, he sees a group of young people. Bryant, appearing to hold a knife, lunges at another girl who falls to the ground before confronting a second person near a car. That's when Reardon fires four shots, Bryant collapsing. She had a knife, she just went at her. She's a Idiot, man. Officers performed CPR on Brian. Come on, stay with him, Kai. She was pronounced dead at the hospital. The state has launched an independent investigation. We have to ask ourselves, what information did the officer have? And what would have happened if he had taken no action at all? Mm -hmm. We don't yet have those answers. Franklin County Children's Services says Bryant was a foster child under their care. Unfolding just before the Derek Chauvin verdict was released, the incident gaining national attention. LeBron James tweeting a photo of Reardon saying, you're next. The NBA star later deleting the tweet, explaining gathering all the facts is important, but adding my anger is still here. Scrutiny on Columbus as officials there call for calm as the investigation unfolds. Now, Officer Reardon has been taken off the street. Investigators are still interviewing witnesses in this case. As for the two females that were confronted by Bryant, we're told they have minor injuries. And again, um, she was only 16 years old. So we've seen uh, Dante Wright, 20 years old. We've seen the children who were filming um, George Floyd, like nine ones as young as nine years old. So the children in the community are highly impacted by police terror when it, when it happens. In the case of Makaya Bryant, uh, some of us asked if she was a white child, would the police have pulled up with their guns <clears throat> out? Would have been a taser used or rubber bullets? 
um, just trying to see if people are, uh, if the police can see the humanity in black children. Okay, we can go to the next one. And um, so one of the one of the hardest parts of the George Floyd trial was seeing the bravery of, of the black youth as they had. First, they were brave enough to film uh, Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd. Then they had to come back and testify about what they saw. Um, so we, if we could uh, play the clip. I'm deleting you. I met someone. Oh my God, what happens now? And you. This witness Nine. is a minor, as you can hear, so oh, we're not going to see her. We will only hear her. Let's listen. Ten. And then you've got a tenth birthday coming up. Yes. What grade are you in? Third. Do you have a cousin named Darnell? Yes. Uh, do you remember? going with her sometime last year in May. Yeah. You went, you have to let me finish my question, but do you remember going with her uh, to Cup Foods? Yes. And uh, you like going to Cup Foods to buy snacks? Yes. Uh, did you go with your cousin Darnella sometime in May of last year to get snacks? Yeah. Let me show you what's uh, Exhibit 14. Yeah. And when you came out of the, the cup foods, do you remember what you did next when you came out? I, I saw the officer put a knee on neck on George Floyd. Okay, now you mentioned someone named George Floyd. Yes. Uh, did you know George Floyd before May 25th? I can't hear I, I, Could you say that again? You can't hear no. Okay. Have you ever met George Floyd before uh, no. going into cut foods that day? No. Uh, as far as you know, had you ever seen it? No. Now, when you uh, came out to where your cousin was and you saw George Floyd, was there a policeman there? Yes. Uh, do you remember what the policeman or policemen were doing? Putting a knee on with George Floyd. Um, if I showed you a picture of a policeman, why don't I just do that? Let me ask you if you recognize the policeman in what's marked as Exhibit 17. Do you recognize this man? Yes. Um, who is he? I can't remember his name. Okay. Do you remember what he was doing? How do you know him? He was pushing me and my boy George Floyd. Do you see him in the courtroom today? No. Okay. How about him? Yes. All right. So is that the person that you, you saw? Yes. Uh, so you saw a knee being put uh, on the neck of George Floyd. When was the knee taken? Did you see that the knee was ever taken off of George Floyd's neck? No. Uh, were you there when an ambulance came? Yes. Tell us what happened after you saw the ambulance come. 
he has the m has had to push them off of them. And how did that happen? Did they simply come in an ambulance and they go up to push him off or what happened? Yeah, actually nicely to get off of him. And when they asked him nicely to get off of him, what did he do? He still stayed on him. And then what happened after he still stayed on him? What did the ambulance people do? They just had to put him off and get off of him. Uh, are you able to, to tell us, having been there on this day and seeing the, the officer on top of George Floyd, how did you feel about that? How did it affect you? I was sad and kind of mad. And, and tell us why you were sad and mad. Because it felt like it, he was stopping his breathing and it is kind of like hurting him. Thank you, Judea. I want to ask you the other question. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos. Thanks for checking. Um, thanks. So, uh, as you can see, how this is how um, Black youth are impacted by uh, police terror in our community. And I know Ben. I, I think Ben has a question. If we could let him ask that real quick. Ben, can you hear me? Uh, ben, I believe you could unmute yourself and you should have the ability to speak. And Trey Hearn, uh, just for a time check, I wanted to let you know that it is 1.20. This wraps up at uh, 1.50, so about oh. a half. Okay, we can smack, go through. Uh, we can go to the next clip. Uh, I went to Ben and I think I requested to unmute him, I believe. Um, did you, you said he had a question? Yeah. The button doesn't seem to be working for me. Maybe he could ask you in chat, presumably. Okay. We can go to the next clip. I'll, I'll answer it once, as soon as we start. If he goes to the participants window, he can unmute himself, but he may not be know that. Yeah, he can. Okay, why don't you continue on and uh, when Ben becomes available, uh, he can jump in. We got a good half hour left. Okay. Would you like me to play the video first? Oh, uh, so yeah, yep. And this is just keeping on with the theme of how the children are impacted by, by police terror in the community. The Minneapolis teenager whose cell phone video of Jarek Chauvin's deadly arrest of George Floyd sparked worldwide protests, wept on the witness stand as she described what she saw that day. More on the second day of the former policeman's murder trial in this report. Uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen how you're viewing, experiencing what happened to George Floyd has affected your life? Day two of the murder trial of ex-Minneapolis cop Derek Chauvin brought emotional testimony from at least two eyewitnesses to Chauvin's deadly arrest of George Floyd last May. Darnella Frazier, the teenage girl whose cell phone video of the incident was seen around the world, cried when recalling that day, her face kept off camera due to her young age. When I look at George Floyd, I look at, I look at my dad, I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they are all black. And I, I look at that and I look at how that could have been one of them. It's the nights I stayed up apologizing and and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life, but it's like, 
it's not what I should have done. It's what he should have done. With that, she turned to Chauvin, whose lawyers began to object to her response. Frazier was walking her nine-year-old cousin to buy snacks at a small grocery, where moments earlier a worker had accused Floyd of using a fake $20 bill when she said she saw Chauvin with his knee on Floyd's neck. I heard George Floyd saying, I can't breathe, please get off of me. I can't breathe. He, he cried for his mom. He was in pain. It seemed like he knew. It seemed like he knew it was over for him. Another witness, professional mixed martial arts fighter Donald Williams, who can be heard on Frazier's video hurling insults at police as he demanded they check Floyd's pulse, described on the stand why he called 911 after Floyd's arrest. At some point, um, did you make a 911 call? That is correct. Uh, they called the police on the police. Right. And why did you do that? Because uh, I believe I witnessed a murder. He then dabbed his eyes with a tissue as a recording of that call was played back in the courtroom. He told him to check the, the man pulse, but they wouldn't even check his, uh, the pulse. Chauvin's lawyers have sought to convince the jury that Chauvin may have felt threatened by bystanders. They say he followed his police training and is not guilty of the charges brought by the Minnesota Attorney General's Office of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, or second-degree manslaughter. Thank you. We can go to the. And then, um, so just to reiterate, a, a lot of these with uh, Derek Chauvin would not have been arrested if there wasn't um, some form of civil um, unrest. Um, Kim Potter wouldn't have been arrested if there wasn't some form of uh, civil unrest here in Minnesota. Eventually, when uh, the chief of police first seen the video, he thought that it was um, okay. It was not until activists, it was not until activists stepped up and started um, putting pressure on, on the city that there was an arrest made and that the chiefs felt that, uh, that it was wrong. Uh, we can go to the next slide. There's no audio to this, so you folks know that. Okay. Thank you. And then we could just slide through the rest of these too. So yeah, that was, um, okay. Oh, so that was a, a protest that we also had here in St. Paul for um, Desmond Knight is a, again, another child. He's 13 years old. Uh, there was a raid on his house and he was choked and, and lifted off. And we're still trying to get the body camera footage of that incident. Um, we can go to the next slide. And this was an actual school walkout that was happening during um, during the protest and I think some some of the kids were being texted the N word because they had started a, a group. Uh, so uh, the kid, the, the youth themselves organized the school walkout and, ha and had a march. Uh, this And this was at White Bear Lake High School. And just uh, the Green Party of Minnesota adopted uh, the BLM spring agenda and just real quick, uh, a few and a couple of those we already 
I think we we we, we accomplished was uh, we demand that Derek Chauvin be convicted and sent to prison. Uh, the jury selection process in the United States is still racist. We demand a black woman or man whose ancestors descend from slavery to be on the jury. I think that happened. Uh, we we demanded that the same amount of money spent on security for the trial be spent on housing housing for homeless in Minneapolis, and, and not sure if that happened. Uh, we demand that Thurman Blevins. Mark Clark and Terrence Franklin's case be reopened, uh, that their families be comp properly compensated. That didn't happen. Uh, we want the uh, the Green Party last year, uh, we adopted uh, requiring all police officers to carry personal liability insurance. So that was part of our demands. And that was part of the legislative session, but it didn't pass. Uh, we want to renegotiate the contract with the police union. Uh, we want community control of the police. We want to end the 1033 grant program and that 1033 grant program is what's given uh, those rubber bullets and those explosives uh, from the Pentagon to use on, on protesters. Uh, we want a national database of killer cops. We demand that the Hardell, Hardell Sherrill Act be passed into law. And we can check that off because that was passed, off, passed into law um, during a special session. Uh, we, we demand that the families of stolen lives be granted access to any body camera footage within 24 hours of related that results in death. That didn't, we didn't get down to 24, but I think uh, the governors got it to five days. And then we demand reparations for the American descendants of chattel slavery that addresses the criminal injustice system and stopping police terror in the United States. So the St. Paul City Council did pass a resolution uh, to start working on uh, on that issue, so we did we did check off some of our demands, and I uh, because of time, I'd like to open it up to questions, to some questions. All right, we're gonna uh, Tay Hearn, if you could go back to the chat, maybe address any uh, your particular order. I'd also like to ask Kathy if you would be best to hit mute on your microphone. Occasionally, we get some background static from you. So how do we commit BLM in the U.S. to the global liberation movement? So I think right now there is BLM is global, and I think um, I think where we're starting off are things that we have in common, like climate change. So I, I know BLM global, which a lot of the other grassroots chapters are not a part of, but we still have some of the same interests like climate change. Uh, I think they're starting to tackle climate change on a global level. So that's, uh, and we will hear too in, in, in Minnesota that we're gonna have to address climate change because that is a, a racial justice issue too. Also issues with uh, uh, some of the policing that's happening in, in places like Africa or, or different countries like that. So I think we're starting, and then just because the protests were we're global just by having a global reach and, and connecting with people uh, across the world. I, and the Green Party is real important to that too, because when this was happening, we were able to connect with uh, the Green Party uh, of Wales and, some, and uh, some of the leadership over there. And then they began to throw protests for George Floyd and they started taking down statues. And then Lloyd of London came to the table uh, to start discussing reparations. And that had never, even uh, people here in the United States had sued L Lloyds in London and were not successful. But then when, uh, when the people over there engaged in civil disobedience, Lloyds in London came to the table. So I think um, we kind of already had the Green Party, BLM, we kind of have the infrastructure in place to kind of uh, do, get, Get the global the global uh, movement going on more, but I I think ours should be more grassroots. Oh, so I think with uh, I don't know if there's competing groups, but I think there's two different there's groups that are connect connected to the national chapter. And then there's groups that are not uh, connected to the national chapter. 
but what I what I start to find is that um, the groups, the grassroots chapters influence the national chapter the same. So the Minnesota, I mean, we were some of the first ones to be pushing reparations and then uh, the national chapter started talking about reparations and develop a, developing a platform. A lot of the things, their uh, 10 point program where, where they talk about um, renegotiating the contract that was coming up out of here when we were dealing with Jamar Clark. Um, a lot of the things that they have on their 10 point platform platform was started it's coming from the grassroots and then they adopt it so uh those are, that's what i see happening so i don't think i think the problem is that um the month there's so much money raised and um it didn't get down to the people who were do, actually doing the work on the ground like our chapter or some of the chapters in new york and stuff that are actually shutting down traffic and it's not and people need money to actually do the work because there's people in jail. We have people right now that are facing charges for protesting and stuff like that. So, um, so some of that, I think that's kind of one of the most contentious issues is that they were raising money while we were in the streets doing the work. And then I urge Greens and activists to be strategic in calling for reforms that advance it. the changes we want without alienating and entrenching grassroots people in, in the polls. Well, I, I, um, and I don't wanna, we definitely sh should not alienate grassroots people, but I mean, I don't wanna alienate the police, but the police alienate black people. They don't just alienate us, they murder us, you know, and they, kill us and they take us to prison. So it's like, we don't, um, I think here in, in, in St. Paul, it's like, we have to have something that checks the police though to keep them from uh, just running amok and just killing people, murdering people, not even that, just uh, like a, the impact, going back to the impact, we can talk about the impact of a traffic stop. So we just seen the extreme impact of a traffic stop with Dante Wright, where it resulted in death. But say he uh, survived that, then his car would have been towed. If he had, if he was working and was arrested, he would miss work. Then he'd have to pay, I think it's uh, $160 for the tow. And then each day is like $25, $30. The median income for the black family is seven in the United States is $17,000. So these are when you have these encounters with the police, there are economic consequences to that too, that um, that have an impact on people's lives. So um, we don't want to alien. I mean, we, we don't want to alienate the police, but I, we do have to continue to hold them account, accountable. And here in Minnesota, when when Derek Derek Chauvin's the second oh, since 2000, there's been 400 people killed by the police. And Derek Chauvin is the only the second person to be convicted in Minnesota history. And the first one was Muhammad Noor, but he was a black Somalian um, Muslim. So we kind of expected that to happen. Uh, if I may, I just wanted to give you a 10 minute warning. Okay. Oh, and then uh, Mr. Schooneman's on the, on the, he just posted in the chat, going back to what George Floyd Square and what it meant to people. So the group, I think when the initial group had a list of demands, what they should have added was, um, you know, we want people wanted to, uh, we have these encampments or where we shut stuff down and, and people can't go, can't go there. Uh, so we occupy the place where uh, right now we're trying to occupy over there off of Hennepin where Winston Smith was killed a couple of weeks ago, but over at George Floyd Square, they uh, have people come in and take the, the occupation down and start removing some of the barriers. And part of their list of demands should have been to make George Floyd Square a, a historical monument and it could have fell under the Preservation Act where that street wouldn't have had to uh, be opened up like that and people could have came 
So right here on Summit University, because some of those houses are historic, they fall under the Historical Preservation Act. And you can't even like, sometimes you can't even build fences on some of those properties. So that same thing could have applied to what happened at George Floyd Square. But now, what since they tore it down, what they're gonna try to do is build like uh, condos and uh, gentrification basically is what might happen to George Floyd Square if people can't push back uh, so this uh, initiative that Mr. Schooneman is talking about is talking about trying to make George Floyd Square a, a historical monument. And Ben had a question. I don't know if Ben is Ben able. Is he still with us? Yeah. Ben, did you want to actually ask that question, or? Yeah, I believe you should be able to unmute yourself, Ben. Oh, and then, so Hillary said the same thing happened last fall with Walter Wallace. The family called the police because Walter was having a mental health episode. So some of our, uh, some of the things was also about this is some solutions. So we want uh, mental health professionals to respond to uh, mental health calls. A lot of calls from what I think 7% of calls, 7% uh, of police calls involve a gun. So we don't think that when, when, if something doesn't involve a gun that the police shouldn't show up with guns or there should be like mental health professionals that can respond to some of these calls instead of having, when people call for help, uh, they get hurt or get death. So if somebody's calling for help, they shouldn't, they shouldn't get killed. At one point here, not, I think 2019 and that winter, there were five mental health calls and they all resulted in death by the police. So that's why we want uh, mental health just different. And our and what we were blessed to have during uh, this whole thing was Green leader and city councilman Cam Gordon, who was leading the charge on uh, just to, talking about transforming what the police should look like and what they do and things like that. Um, he's, there's some things going on where they're going to have to look at our charter at the charter in Minneapolis as far as um, I won't say defunding or so they just had a law where they said they have to have a certain amount of police for um, the city of St. Paul. There was a law for the city of Minneapolis where they need to have because of the city charter that the city needs to have a certain amount of police. So I think Cam and some of uh, the others on the city council are going to start addressing that and just start addressing what uh, what what police look like. And a lot, some people say defund, there's also the abolish the police movement. And a lot of people connect that to the abolishing of slavery. And then also uh, just going back to some, uh, some of the solutions, reparations, we already seen that, that pass, but another part of reparations is a confronting the criminal injustice system and freeing political prisoners too. Uh, ben had asked a question about grand juries. And I think uh, I know in, uh, and I think activists are looking for any, any, anything that's going to help uh, hold cops accountable. And sometimes they look to grand juries, but then Sometimes these grand juries are not successful in getting officers charged. So I don't think it was successful with um, in Eric Garner's case. I know it wasn't successful here with Marcus Golden. And, and I think with grand juries, and I think Jamar Clark too. And I think some of the issues are that the prosecutor gets to choose what evidence he can give to the grand jury and things like that. So it might not be as, uh, as transparent as it should be. And then with Derek Chauvin, I, we, um, there were actually no, the thing about his conviction was Minnesota hadn't uh, passed any new legislation and still really hasn't passed any, besides the Hardell-Sherrill Act, any uh, 
tangible tangible re legislation around policing. So Derek Chauvin was convicted off laws that already exist on the books. And I think that that should, that should happen more. We shouldn't, we definitely want to put in new legislation to hold police accountable. But if we just follow the law, I think that we, um, that more, you, we could see more convictions and stuff. And hopefully uh, just stop, stop uh, the police from killing us in the first place. Three minute warning. Wow. Are there any more questions? So I think uh, um, I'd like to thank you all for taking some time out of your uh, day, your work day during the day to start off this, uh, some of our first workshops uh, with the Green Party of the United States in our annual national meeting. We have a lot of uh, great workshops ahead of us this week. So please enjoy yourself but, uh, while you're while you're out, please start having this conversation about uh, policing in the United States. And um, let's keep creating policies and uh, add more police accountability measures to our platform too. And also in, in your respective states and CDs, if you can start pushing, if we can start pushing some of this legislation at the local level, like uh, making, making sure police uh, have things that are on, on our platform, we can start with uh, ensuring the police. And I think they've been successful with that in Colorado. And if you guys need any um, things on reparations for the locals, I can share that information with you too. So you can take it and format it for your, I'll give you guys what we use to get it passed up here. And then you can just tweak it for your uh, local so you can utilize it too. Uh, thank you all, and I will see you guys at the next workshops. Thank you very much for uh, all your hard work. It was a really great presentation. You did a fantastic job. I thank appreciate you. it. You go. Appreciate it, all you, and it's great to be green. It is great to be green. <laughs> see you all at the rest of the uh, events. All right, peace.